We are very fortunate this morning that among our guests, Brother Duncan Kinsey is going to be exhorting us this morning. His remarks are untitled this morning, but he's asked that we read from the book of John, chapter 19. John chapter 19. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put him on put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and the power to release you? Jesus answered, you have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat in down in the judgment seat in the place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and the two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, where it shall be, that the scripture might be, be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be, be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. 
Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who was at first come to Jesus by night, who first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the customs of as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place that he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. We'll now give our attention to Brother Duncan Kinsey. Okay, I'll just stay at the podium. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brother Duncan Kenzie, and I'm from uh, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. That's the far west coast of the continent. And in case you're wondering what the size of the island, it's a little bit bigger than Gilligan's Island. <laughs> it's about 350 miles long, I think. So it's quite a substantial place. I'm with uh, my wife Jillian, and we're very happy to be here. We're both um, involved with uh, Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation in various capacities, and we've had the, the annual general meeting here this weekend, and we thank you very much for your hospitality, for making us feel welcome. And this is a, a beautiful place and beautiful people, which obviously is is a little bit more important than the place itself, right? The, the building is, is nice, but it's more significant that the people that we meet with are um, believers with true hearts and pure hearts. And uh, we have an opportunity to demonstrate love to one another at times like this. So I, I chose um, the reading today because it's the third reading in, in the uh, daily, in Robert Robert's daily planner, and that's kind of what I typically do at our ecclesia. We do the daily readings on a Sunday, and it just makes it easier for me to come up with a topic, and also it helps me avoid talking about my pet peeves. Although I'll probably sl sneak some of those into the talk anyway, so if I do, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, I'm not going to tell you just yet which particular... Uh, part of John 19 struck me with interest, uh, but perhaps you'll see it as we start going through the exhortation. So I just was struck, I, I was thinking about how many times that Jesus came into contact with people around him. And we know he came into contact with people from all walks of life, right? People rich and poor, people uh, destitute and sick, people who uh, had positions of high authority in society. But 
he not only came in, he not only spoke to those people, but there was an aspect of his ministry that actually involved touching, physical touching. And uh, if you go through the Gospels, I think you'll find many places where Jesus either touched people or was touched himself. So I'm just going to give you a, some, a list of some of those occasions. I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but uh, it, it's quite lengthy. So first of all, there would be Mary, of course. She was his mother. There was John the Baptist at Jesus' baptism. John the Baptist would have touched Jesus and immersed him. There was Thomas after his uh, resurrection, doubting Thomas. And Jesus said, you know, come here and touch me and see. Uh, and there was Nicodemus when he took down the body of Jesus. Now, you think about that for a moment. You know, that, that's quite an amazing thing to have actually Nicodemus have that privilege of lifting down the body of the Lord Jesus Christ after he died and, and uh, trying to honor it and show it respect. There were the disciples who experienced Jesus washing their feet. There were the lepers who Jesus touched in Matthew 8, verse 3, which you know brought on the whole discussion about was he being defiled by them or was he making them holy in contrast. There was um, Peter's mother-in-law who was sick and Jesus came and touched her. That's mentioned in Matthew 8. There were two blind men that he touched, but it's mentioned in Matthew 9. There were the disciples at the transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 7, 7 where they, they fell down, and Jesus, at the text says specifically, he touched them and said, do not be afraid. Uh, there were two more blind men. There was a deaf person. Uh, there was the high priest's servant, Malchus. Jesus touched his ear, and that's mentioned in Luke 22. There were the angels at the resurrection. You know, when we read John's gospel account of Jesus' death and his burial in the tomb and his resurrection, uh, there's that scene where Peter and John are running to the cave, and uh, Peter gets there first, but it's John who goes inside, and John finds all these wrappings there, and he finds the face cloth that is neatly wrapped up. And that's the, that's the picture we have. That's the very first picture we have of the risen Lord. Is We don't see his body, but we see the fact of his resurrection in that neatly organized scene in the tomb. And if you've ever wondered whether the Shroud of Turin is real, I think that explanation or that description in John tells us right away that it couldn't have been real because John uses a word that mentions wrappings around Jesus, like a mummy. And the face cloth would have gone over his face like this, and then they would have wrapped around it. But just imagine the, the angels gently taking off all those wrappings and removing the face cloth from Jesus and Jesus standing there and realizing he has been born anew to eternal life and the angels are there helping him in that process. So they touched him. There was Peter walking on water, which is described in Matthew 14 and 31. And we all know that story where Jesus reaches out his hand and grabs Peter. There is Mary in John chapter 12 who comes and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. And to me, that's a particular poignant and intimate scene that is described by John there, showing Mary's um, worshiping of Jesus in a sense. Um, there was Jesus putting the children on his knee and saying, to such belongs the kingdom of God. There was Jairus' daughter, and he took her by the hand and raised her up. That's mentioned in Luke chapter 8. So there's all these descriptions scattered throughout the text that show us that Jesus was intimately involved with the people 
that he was serving, that he was teaching, that he was leading and shepherding. He wasn't a distant person who was remote and who was haughty or who was above them, but he was a person who tried to really connect in a very real way, emotionally, spiritually, in terms of miracles of healing, and in terms of physical touch. Now, during the pandemic, I think this was one of the things that we all suffered from the most. The pandemic, I think, has had a cataclysmic effect on us, on, on the world, on our countries, and on the community of believers. Uh, for some of us, perhaps, we don't see any difference, and we've just returned to meeting as if everything is normal. But for a number of people, it has caused them to either um, reevaluate their relationships with, with other believers, reevaluate their faith, or to um, feel a sense of loss that has come about as a result of feeling separated during the pandemic. So uh, we had the blessing of Zoom during the pandemic that kept us together in some ways. But one of the downsides was that we couldn't have private conversations with one another easily. And I think that's one of the greatest benefits of being in physical community, being physically present in this building. I've had two or three snippets of conversations with people this morning that were crucial conversations. A crucial conversation is one where there's high value to a conversation. It's not just, hi, how are you this morning? but it's talking about things that have real impact and real meaning in people's lives. So I've had conversations relating to questions of faith. I've had, question, I've had conversations relating to mourning the death of a loved one. I've had conversations relating to connecting with somebody who I knew, knew a long time ago and renewing, rekindling friendships. So those are all crucial, meaningful conversations with high value to them that we can only have when we're in person. You know, I think we kind of uh, forget some of the impact or some of the circumstances of the pandemic already. You know, it was a time when everybody was wearing masks everywhere we went, and it was completely normal. So Jillian and I were talking the other day, and we were reflecting back on when she went to deliver sleeping bags uh, for the Garden Project. The Garden Project is a humanitarian, primarily a humanitarian initiative that's part of uh, WCF's work. And so um, Jillian and our daughter Chloe went to deliver sleeping bags to a local shelter. And um, that happened in May of 2020. So it was just two months into the pandemic. And Jillian said to me, she goes, well, was that during the pandemic? I said, yes. And she goes, well, were we, were we wearing masks? And I said, yes. There's photos of you wearing masks. Because you know, I always like to back things up with real data just to prove my point. And so um, I went to Google Photos, and sure enough, there was, there was a photo of Jillian and Chloe delivering these sleeping bags, and she was wearing a mask. So I think it's easy to forget the circumstances under which we lived for that two years and how we were, um, we, it resulted in us being alienated from one another in some sense. Maybe, maybe alienated's a bit strong of a word, but I, I think you get the sense of what I'm trying to say. So touch and connection is an absolutely important part of our lives. And I think the lack of um, context for our lives and, and, and lack of this connection and, and touch can fracture relationships. And ultimately, God is concerned about relationships, isn't he? He's concerned about us having a relationship with him and a relationship with one another. Our faith is not simply propositional. 
It's not a faith where we simply say we have this list of teachings that we all subscribe to, and when we come here on a Sunday morning, it's kind of like a corporate entity where we're just going through our job of being here present in the building because we all believe this set of propositions. It's, our faith is not transactional. It's not a faith that says, okay, God, you did this for me, so I'm going to do that for you. Or, God, I'm expecting a reward at the end of this. Because God commands men everywhere to repent and to serve him. He commands us to believe in him and to follow him. It's not a question of, are we going to get a reward? The reward is the logical outcome of a life of service and a life of commitment to him and a life of developing a relationship with our Lord and Savior and with our God. And it's also a life of developing meaningful, powerful relationships with one another. It's not enough for us to just show up and say, I've gone through the motions of being here at Sunday morning meeting, or I've gone through the motions of being at Bible class, or I've gone through the motions of delivering sleeping bags to the poor. That's not, that's not God's intent. His intent is for us to build relationships. And um, we can see this in his promises. So the greatest promise of scripture, does anybody here know or think they know what the greatest promise of scripture is. The promise that's repeated the most times, and therefore I would say is the greatest, okay, by my definition. The promise that's repeated the most times in scripture. Anybody know it? Class, class? Anybody? Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't quite hear that. My hearing is not very good, so. Okay, in Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, thank you for your courage. Um, and you will get a lollipop at the end of the, of the meeting, okay? I believe the answer actually is, I will be your God and you shall be my people. We first see this promise come up in Genesis 17. It comes up again in Exodus 20. It comes up in other parts of the Pentateuch. It comes up in Jeremiah repeatedly. It comes up in Corinthians. And the final place we see it show up is in Revelation chapter 21. And if you go and read that chapter in Revelation, it'll become clear to you that that's, that's what God's purpose is. We talk about God's purpose being to fill the earth with all his glory. But when you look at those two passages, the Numbers 14.21 and the Habakkuk 2.14, they're kind of taken a little bit out of context. I don't mean to say that that isn't God's purpose. God's purpose is certainly that the earth will be filled with his glory. But that happens as a result of him having relationships with us, having a relationship with us. And so God's greatest promise to us is, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And that's relationship oriented. That's what he's striving for. And so when we look at all these instances where Jesus touches people or he comes in contact with them or he spends time sitting down and talking to them and listening to their concerns or he has that conversation with Mary and Martha, that's Jesus trying to build meaningful relationships with Peter, with people. We see it in his relationship with Peter. The, the amount of time that he spent talking to Peter and teaching Peter, and Peter keeps making mistakes or having misunderstandings, and Jesus keeps clarifying them for him and, and helping him to understand. You know, even the time that Jesus spends talking to the Pharisees, a lot of that time is spent in what we think is condemnation, and it's certainly a strong language. When you read Matthew 23, the language there is very strong, isn't it? You know, you're white at sepulchers. Clean the, outs the inside before you clean the outside of the plate. But Jesus takes the time to talk to them. 
It wasn't just a case of defending against them. It was a case of trying to bring the Pharisees on side. And guess what? When we get to Acts, how many people do we see who are converted who are Pharisees? We see Nicodemus and um, others like him who, who are converted. So we need to, to reach out to one another and try and build relationships with one another. We need to try to discuss and understand people's personal lives. We need to understand their hopes, their fears, their concerns, their struggles, etc. We need to suspend assessment when we do this. You know, sometimes it's very easy to listen to somebody and go, that's not my story. I can't relate to that at all. And then feel judgmental or feel a sense of assessment. And I, I, I'm as guilty of that as the next person. But I think what it, God wants us to do, what Jesus wants us to do, is listen with an open heart and an open mind to people's needs or, or what's on their minds. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't mean we have to prove that we don't agree with them by, you know, expressing our opinion. Just listening alone can be a key part of that. And we, can, we need to do this earnestly. And I, I really like the word earnest. You know, there's, there's kind of this idea that goes around in society right now that you have to be authentic. You have to be your authentic self. Well, I'm not sure God really wants me to be my authentic self because it's not necessarily very attractive. But he does want me to be earnest. He, God is looking for good and honest hearts and for people who are earnest, who are committed in their desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him. So let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1 in this regard. First Peter chapter one, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Now I'm reading from um, the NIV and I believe in the ESV, it says love one another earnestly. But even here, the NIV, I really like. Love one another deeply from the heart. So this is not a surface love. This is not a just, oh, um, you know, a, a sort of a passing expression of concern. But this is getting engaged in somebody's life. This is touching somebody's life emotionally and spiritually in a very real way. Maybe not so much physically. Some people don't like physical touch. I know people who hate to be hugged, but I like to be hugged. One of the things I loved when I first moved to, to California is everybody there would give hugs. Um, some people aren't comfortable with that, and, that, and that's, that's fine. But we need to find ways to make meaningful, earnest connections one another, with one another. And it's interesting that this word earnest is used here because it's also used in Acts 12 and 5, the only other place in Scripture where it's used. And if we can just um, turn that up. So Acts 12, verse 5. And this is when... Um, James and John were put to death with the sword. And then in verse 3, he proceeded to seize, Herod seized Peter also, and he put him into prison. And after uh, he was there, he was being guarded, and he intended to put him on public trial. So Peter was kept in prison, verse 5, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So that same word that is used to describe how the brothers and sisters were praying for Peter, praying earnestly with genuine love in their hearts for the deliverance of Peter from that prison, that's the word that Peter uses when he describes uh, loving each other earnestly. Okay, now you may be wondering at this point, what does this have to do with um, John 19? Uh, I certainly am. So let's go to John 19 and take a look at it. 
for a moment because this is what struck me about um, when I started to read this chapter. And I, th I think one of the good ways of, of reading the Bible is to just read a chapter and just read it over and over and over again and kind of let it seep in. And, you know, you might, by doing that, have new thoughts emerge or new ideas emerge from the text that you haven't seen before. And this was the one that struck, I keep saying struck me because it's in the text actually. So starting at verse one, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, this to me was incredibly unjust in the first place because Pilate had already admitted that he found no wrong in Jesus, and yet he flogs him anyway. Now, apparently, according to some commentators, that flogging would have been relatively light. But nevertheless, he was punished for something he never did. Of course, we know that punishment gets worse. So then the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put him on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. So these soldiers, it would appear, touched Jesus but in a very different way than all the other contact that people had had with Jesus, where in every other case, it was positive contact and positive association. And then we get this terrible statement in verse three, and it, it had also come up um, in chapter 18 as well, but um, they said to him, hail king of the Jews, and they struck him on the face. They struck him with their hands on the face. And that's the, apparently the Greek word there is to strike with your hands. Now, if you've ever struck anybody with your hands anywhere, and hopefully none of us have, or if you've ever seen it happen, you'll know that it leaves a mark, generally. If it's done hard enough. So can you imagine you being the person who strikes the Lord Jesus Christ? And you feel the sting on your hand after having done that. You see the mark on this man's face of your fingerprints where you have struck him. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ went through for us. He went through that kind of ignominy and shame and injustice to bring us to this point that we're at today, where we think about the emblems before us, the bread and the cup. And we remember this man, the son of God, who laid down his life willingly for us and went through that kind of humiliation. After all that positive interaction he'd had with people, the last people who were in, in contact, physical contact with him before he died were buffeting his body and subjecting him to this kind of abuse. I've always been struck by how relatively mild the accounts are in the Gospels of what Jesus was subject to. You know, there have been movies made about the death of Christ. There was one, I think, that Mel Gibson did a number of years ago, and I refused to go see it because I, it was just sort of emphasizing the, the gore and the, and the horror of the incident. And I really think that for the most part, the um, Gospel writers play that down. They don't spend a lot of time dwelling on the physical cruelty. But this humiliation of being slapped in the face just struck me as particularly powerful. It's just, John just states it almost matter-of-factly, and, and yet he would have been there, and he would have been witness to this, and he would have been witness to the rest of the crimes that had happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we weren't there for that, and I thought it was quite remarkable that we sang that last um, hymn that we did, Were You There When They Crucified Our Lord? Because we weren't there. So we didn't experience the physical touch. We didn't experience 
the um, opportunity to actually talk face to face with Jesus. We didn't experience miracles at his hand. And Peter, again, is one who talks about this. And it's actually mentioned in several places in scripture, but um, the first Peter is the one that I'd like us to look at. So first Peter one verse eight says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So as we read the Bible together and we think about the Lord Jesus Christ and he is brought to life for us through the words of scripture, we can reflect on what Peter is saying, somebody who had seen him and had lived with him through all the highs and lows of his ministry and recognize that it is possible for us to have a real meaningful relationship with our Lord by thinking about these things, by reading about them, by praying, by meditating, by sharing stories with one another and discussing the word of God with one another. So that even though we haven't had the blessing of seeing him, we can still believe in him and we can still be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because of the free gift of salvation that has been given to us through his work. So we'll just close with um, a passage we're all quite familiar with. 1 John chapter 1, verse, um, verses 1 to 3. Sorry, 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should have this, this relationship with God. We've talked about a relationship, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So if we spend time getting to know the Lord Jesus in this life, through reading the scriptures together and through sharing with one another, brothers and sisters, children of God, things that are meaningful and serious in our, in our lives, then we shall be like him, we shall know him, and we shall see him as he is.